All right, guys, welcome to this week's Management Moment, and I'm here with Stephen Chilcote. We are standing on the Penn State University Research Farms here out in State College, Pennsylvania. Stephen, today we're talking uh, a little bit about food plot, what types of food plots people should be considering, um, and you've been doing a lot of work here. So where are we right now? What are we standing in, and how is this going to help a farmer or a hunter uh, when it comes to managing? Well, this is managing? a 800 acre research farm. There's a whole lot of different experimental things going on here, and they give me this little two and a half acre field to mess around with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's done through the QDMA. Okay. Uh, we can do some forestry work up in the woods there. And this is my experimental food plot area. So I try different things here and see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, what I'm trying to get into is, and get my clients into and get people thinking about is using cover crop cocktails for food plots. Now what's the benefit of doing a <coughs> cover crop as opposed to maybe just like a bean or a, uh, we've got some sunflowers in here, you know, and staying just to, to one species of forage? Well, there's a lot of reasons, but the main one is soil health. Anytime that you use a cover crop cocktail, you're feeding the microbes mm -hmm. and the mycorrhizal fungi that are down in the soil, and that's really what brings nutrients to your plants. Um, fertilizer is great, but you don't absolutely need fertilizer if you're not taking your crop away from the field. You should be able to create a system that feeds itself. Um, so for soil health, cover crops are the way to go. Um, and food plots are just a little bit different from ag in that we don't necessarily take our crop away. On that corn over there, somebody will cut that for silage, mm -hmm. and all the nutrients that are in that corn are going to leave the, the property. Okay. Where here, the deer are eating here, the plants are dying and rotting away here, so all the nutrients should stay here. So that keeps everything into the soil. It allows us to have that, that high nitrogen-based soil where if we were to turn this, we're gonna lose a lot of that nitrogen and a lot, of, a lot of that mineral that's in the soil. Yeah, we're trying to go to cover crop no-till systems where you don't have to till. For one thing, it's expensive, time-consuming, and it's really bad for your soil. You get erosion, you get dryness. If you have drought, this, this thing, it could not rain again for the rest of the year, mm -hmm. and this will be fine because the ground is shaded and the roots are all different depths down into the ground. Different plants have different root systems. Okay. And the benefit of different root systems is that the different plants reach down to different depths and they also collect different nutrients and bring them back to the surface to be used again next year. Well, let's talk a little bit about the history of this field that you've got planted that you've been working on now. It started off um, pretty much a, a burnt field, uh, very dry. Yeah, uh, this field has a problem and that is foxtail. This foxtail grass is very aggressive in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has a tendency to sneak up on you because you think it's not there, but as soon as the weather gets hot and you're out working and you're doing other things in the summertime, you come back in the middle of July and you got foxtail up to here. Mm -hmm. So this got left go, and as you look out through there, you can see all the, the little seed heads. Yes. There's millions and millions of seeds all out the there place. now. There's also millions of seeds in the soil. Mm -hmm. So what happened here was I had the uh, research guys uh, I'm at the kind of at the mercy of the equipment here and the personnel here and I just can request things and when they come out and do it it doesn't always get done when and how I, I, I really imagined that it should be so what they did was they did a nice burn down and we had a, a brown field and it looked like our switchgrass was or our, not our switchgrass but our our foxtail was dead uh, I meant to no-till this in but somebody tilled it and when they chisel plowed this, they created a perfect seed bed for foxtail to germinate again. So we got foxtail. Mm -hmm. We also have, besides the foxtail, we have crabgrass here. We have lamb's quarter, ragweed. Now lamb's quarter and ragweed are not necessarily the worst thing because they are native forage right. for deer and deer will eat they them. They will eat that. As yes. long as they're not taking over your field, you're mm -hmm. fine. Foxtail has a tendency to really take things over. It does, it, and, it, and it can smother out a lot of that seed that you're trying to plant down in there. It won't get the necessary sunlight and whatnot. It takes and, up all the growing space. Yep, yeah, so there's not a lot. So 
you you kind of did that um, and even though we have a lot of that foxtail coming up you've got a good variety of forage species in here I mean obviously the first one that we're seeing here very is, is sunflower yeah. and there's a lot of benefits for sunflower sunflower is a great soil building plant and also it the deer will eat the foliage and then when the when the flower goes to seed that seed provides food for bears turkeys deer uh, birds, a lot of everything eats sunflowers. Mm -hmm. Plus, it looks great. So yeah, you know you can't beat it. It gives you a real pretty looking food plot. Mm -hmm. Now, in another place where I have this same mix, everything's kind of chewed on. We don't have a lot of deer pressure here, so it looks fairly good. But where deer are foraging, you'll see that all these are chewed off. However, they don't eat the flower. The flower usually makes it anyway. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is, is put in something like a pea that will climb up this long stem. Some of these sunflowers out here are four or five feet tall. Peas can climb those, deer can eat the leaves, then they can eat the seeds in the fall. Now, let's, we've got the sunflower here. What other kind of a seed mix do we have in here? Obviously, we see we've got some soybean, we've got some, uh, some brassicas, where they've got radishes in here. We have tillage radish, dwarf Essex rape, mm -hmm. Facelia, which didn't make it, I don't see it here, so that's okay. Buckwheat did not make it as well. Now the thing with buckwheat is, it's a terrific soil building plant, but I'm not gonna use it in my spring mixes anymore because it doesn't really compete with cool season plants. Mm -hmm. it, it needs really hot weather to thrive. So the best thing to do with buckwheat is plant it in June when it gets hot. Okay. It's 90 degrees out, that's when you wanna plant that. And it'll be up in looking good in only three weeks. You can use it as a smother plant, you can use it as a soil builder, mm -hmm. uh, just to get some green on the ground. Uh, you know, for some reason you may not uh, have things planted early in the spring, maybe you had too much rain, or maybe you had a weed problem, you need to get that killed down. And then buckwheat would be a good thing to just cover your soil until fall when you plant your fall planting. So this, is, and talking about fall planting, this is basically a summer food crop, if you have the ability to rotate your, your, your food plots, this would be your summer blend. Yeah. And then, and then going forward now, if someone has the ability, this is about, what is this, about an acre? There's half acre, two, acres two acres in this same planting here. Okay. So we're looking at this blend here, more of a summer, yeah. and then in, going into the fall, what time of the year, uh, August, end of August, September, start to do so, like an overseed? Right, we're approaching the end of August now. So you can do one of two things. You can just let this go, let the deer eat whatever's here, and then by winter time, probably by hunting season, this will be a biological desert again because if you do have a deer population, population right. we don't have a lot of pressure here because there's eight, eight, 800 acres of beautiful chow mm -hmm. here for deer and really not that many deer. But if you had this on a property that's out in the woods and you have a lot of deer coming to it, this will get wiped out by Christmas time. There won't be anything there for the whole winter. So better, if you have the budget and the time, better to get a seed drill now, like from now, late August to mid-September, and drill in your winter cover. Your winter covers, I like to use uh, onless winter wheat, and I like to use brassicas, of course. Everybody knows about brassicas. I like to put about four different kinds in my blend. And winter peas, Austrian winter peas, put them on heavy because they don't take up a lot of space, but they are great forage and they will stand up to a lot of cold weather. Mm -hmm. That'll be the first thing that's gonna green up early in the spring. Exactly. So now you have a field that'll feed deer. Deer can paw right down through the snow the more snow you get, the better, because mm -hmm. it'll insulate the plants and they'll continue to grow. They'll dig down and they'll get that winter wheat. And then in the spring, it'll green up and you'll have every deer in the world on that because nothing else is greened up yet. It greens up very early. Right. And then in the summer, you'll have a seed head. And if you use onless wheat, the deer will eat the seeds. Exactly. Then you can drill your next cover in. You can put beans in through that. The trouble with beans is that you need a lot, a lot of space. If you don't have a lot of space, do something else because deer like beans so much they just won't let them grow. Yeah, they, they will not have a chance to get to their full now, maturity. What we, what we can do 
is put an electric fence around one of your areas where you have beans and it'll keep the deer off until they can get to where they can withstand browse. Right. The trouble with a bean is a deer wants to eat that terminal growth and once they nip that off, it's not gonna turn into anything. Right. Now your forage style beans, they're designed to put out more sprouts and they do a little better, but you still end up with a bean that's like six or six or eight inches tall instead mm -hmm. of you know, these beans are two feet tall almost. Yeah, they're a couple feet. Yeah. So. Now we're talking uh, on this particular area. This is obviously a research area. We have the ability, what Stephen does, to, you know, bring in equipment that Penn State and the Ag Resources Center has. But, you know, your general John Q. public hunter, yeah. you know, may not have access to that kind of equipment. Can they still do a blend like this with a poor man's type of plot? You can do that. Uh, if you're way out in the woods and you can't get equipment back there, there's different options. You can either go to your local farmer, uh, talk to the NRCS, the, every, every county has a seed drill and they will rent that out to people who want to put cover crops in because it's such an important thing to save soil right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You can rent those seed drills for 50 bucks an acre. Now, you have to have a tractor that's got enough horsepower to pull that pull thing. that mm -hmm. so if you don't have that the the seed drill companies are getting smart and they're making smaller and smaller seed drills to where you can pull them with a four-wheeler okay still expensive so if you don't want to spend the money now you're down to you don't need to spend any any more than 20 bucks on a on a bag with a turner and you can do pretty much anything you want to do with that. Exactly. And that's how we do a lot of our plots because we're back into the woods. They're not really big. They're not this big of a plot. Yeah. Um, and we're doing the poor man's plot where we have a seed with a turner and we're taking back rakes and, and just raking away a little you, bit. You don't even need a four-wheeler. Yep. It, it all depends on how many guys and how many strong backs you have. That's so, exactly right. Now, I've actually gone through a field with a weed whacker. Mm -hmm. And if I have thistle that's about to go to seed, it's in flower, I'll just knock the heads off of that. I don't even need to spray. It's just a matter of how much time and effort you want right. to put into it. Very good, okay. Well folks, if you have any questions about how you want to set up your next food plot area or how big the area is or anything like that, contact us here at Wild Bow Hunting or contact Stephen Chilcote at Stephen Chilcote Land and Timber Consultants. You'll catch him on Facebook. He's also got a YouTube channel with lots of great information. And that's it for this week's management moment. Next week, we're gonna be going to another property talking more land management and managing for wildlife. Be sure and hit the like and subscribe button and click on the bell so you'll be notified when there's a new video. And comment down below, let me know if there's anything you'd like to know more about.